folks, welcome. My name is Katie Hazard and I am the Associate Director of Art Management for Burning Man, which means I get to run the art department at Burning Man, which is just a totally awesome job. I'm so fortunate to have this role. Um, and I'm really excited to be here with you today and to welcome you to Art Speaks. So if you're new to the series, we are on episode four and we hope to keep these going for quite a long time. So we are really just getting started. Uh, I'd like to invite you to say hello and where you're from in the chat. So as folks are still joining us here, um, it's fun to see where people are calling in from. And oh, let's see. Yeah, it's nice to see a range of, of places that people have already said they're from. And it's really cool that we can be together today in this way, even though we can't be together on Playa as we would be. Uh, it feels like the, the fire still finds a way to bring us together. So I'm happy you'll have a chance to hear from the great artists we have lined up for today. So a couple of tips for Zoom. Um, please keep using the chat as I see that you've been doing um, as much as you want the whole time, you know, cheer on the artists, the, that kind of thing. If you have a particular question for the artists, at the, uh, at the end of the program, we'll have some time to do a Q&A with all the participants here. So you can see there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you wanna go ahead and put your questions in there, that would be great and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so what is Art Speaks? You know, if you're tuning in for the first time, I wanna briefly share what it's all about. So it started as a series on Playa by um, our volunteers, John Valentino, and later with help from Sarah Fisk. And it's, um, so it was a very loved event we had on Playa, these in-person um, artist talks, super cool thing to hear all the behind the scenes stories of the artists. And normally we'd be hosting one of these right now um, in the Everywhere Artery Pavilion on Playa because um, yes, this is the week that we would all be in Black Rock City. You know, we'd be living it up, we'd be working the hardest we work all year, we'd be loving it the most. And it's a weird feeling not being there. Uh, this would have been my 19th year on Playa. It's like almost half my life I've been going and it just feels odd not to be there. But um, I've actually been having a surprisingly good time in the multiverse. There are eight different virtual options this year. Everything from a really simple and sweet black and white hand drawing world, all the way up to full on immersive VR. Although you definitely don't need a VR headset. Um, you could do plenty on your laptop or on your phone. So of course these virtual options don't quite replace the original, but I found it if I think of them as their own kind of artistic expression on their own, um, there's just a lot of heart and soul built into them and it's really worth checking that out if you have a moment. So this episode, I am really excited to have invited a co-host, my dear friend and colleague, Dave X. Dave has been going to Burning Man since 1992. Yes, really 1992. And he started off by creating large scale fire art installations. Um, but by 1999, he saw that the use of fire and flame effects had really reached a tipping point. So he founded the fire art safety team, which we call FAST, and he still manages it today. So I'm super excited to have him here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Dave X. Hey, Katie, uh, thank you for passing it to me. And yeah, it's like 28 years of Burning Man, it's madness. And uh, I'm, I've been working for, I think, 21 years for Burning Man now. I Not only did I manage the fire stuff, but I managed all the fuel at Burning Man. And that was a real journey that I could tell you a lot of stories about. But um, I'm glad that, you know, we've made it all the way through the, all these years and had so much fun at Burning Man. It's really sad that we're not there this year. But hey, you know, that's the one thing you get at Burning Man is unpredictability. So we're going to just roll with it. Um, today, we're going to talk about flame effects. But before I talk about the flame effects, I want to point out fire safety is a huge issue. Like fire is an elemental thing and it's so powerful. And living here in California, you know, we're ravaged by the wildfires and stuff right now. And um, I would be negligent if I didn't mention that, you know, don't just use fire like a, like a toy or whatever. It's an elemental thing and you have to be very careful with it. And the artists that we're going to feature today have used it very correctly. The only reason we can have fire to the extent that we do at Burning Man, the first word in the event is burning, right? The only reason we can have that is because of our impeccable record of safety. And these next few artists are going to talk about the perception of danger, yet the reality of safety within it. So over the years of uh, working with the fire at Burning Man, I noticed that there were three very distinct kind of periods of fire use 
at the event. And we're going to kind of touch on them with some artists that I've picked from each of these three areas. The first years were the early years. And I think that they are primarily performance based use of flame effects where different groups and uh, artists were building machines and then doing a performance with them for the folks. And they seemed so hectic that they're hard to label them as a performance. They were teetering on disaster, but they, but they were definitely entertaining in their way. The second group then that came through added the element of participation. You know, what I mean by that is they added a button that participants could push or some interactive aspect. And the third element now is the most modern of the, the flame effects usage at Burning Man, which really has become like a really safe and well-regulated thing. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at those as, as, as the safety and well-made years, if you, if you want to qualify that. So the first thing we're going to look at is we're going to talk to the artist Christian Risto. He was there in the early years. I believe his first year was 96. And we've got a little video that he put together to, to introduce his work. And then I'll introduce you to the artist.
was really pretty amazing. Uh, and, um, it, you know, seeing all those machines really makes me think about something that predates Burning Man a little bit. If many of you may not be familiar, or you may be, with Survival Research Labs, which was a arts group headed up by Mark Pauline. I think he would hesitate to call it an arts group, but I think a lot of us came from that world of survival research labs. And the reason I asked you, Christian, to join us on this call is you represent that transition from the survival research labs into the Burning Man world. And I think my first question for you is, how do you feel the survival research labs influence those, or, or how do you feel the things from survival research labs in your work first made it to Burning Man, which seems like the original survival research labs were, had to be underground. If the, if the authorities got any wind of it, they're on it in a second. But Burning Man provided a perfect place for this where nobody really cared what you're up to. So can you talk a little bit about the transition from survival research labs to the playa? <laughs> sure, thanks. Hi, Dave. Uh, um, so, yeah, um, it really comes down to this idea of having this wide open space with comparatively few rules, or I want to say no rules, but, and there were less rules then. Uh, but, uh, you know, the whole, I think one of the underlying principles uh, behind the work of SRL and Seaman and People Hater and my, the stuff that I was doing was kind of like to blow people's minds with danger, to make them feel like they were in the presence of something really insane, um, it may, possibly life-threatening, hopefully with the idea that, that that would be transformative for them in some way. Um, and so there was always, you're always riding this line if you're, uh, if you're having to do it in, a, in an urban environment, right? Where do you do it in an urban environment and how can you get away with it? So these were the, these were the things that you're constantly fighting against, um, you know, announcing things through secret channels and not getting permits and all this kind of stuff. And so when, uh, when I first learned about the playa, it was this breath of fresh air. It was like, really, we can go out there and just kind of like do stuff. We can use flamethrowers. And as long as we don't kill anyone, no one's going to like arrest us afterwards. Um, so it was a very, uh, it was a very liberating thing to, to have this venue. It, it was about the venue that, and the, the playa is like, it, whatever everyone knows the play is amazing it's it's liberating and uh and then that for me that also like started to translate a couple years later into the scale of my work where all of a sudden i felt like wow i i don't have to build something that i can just carry in one truckload so that i can get out of there quickly before anyone like finds out what's going on i can build stuff that's really big and carry it on a bunch of trucks or whatever anyway it's a very liberating space and i think it really influenced me in in a lot of ways Dave, I think you're muted. Yeah, sorry about that. It, it, it same thing for me. It depend, the playa just seemed like limitless and it was the perfect place for this art that was hard to do in, uh, in San Francisco, especially where we were all from. And uh, so I, I don't have a lot of time and we're gonna move on to the next group, but I do wanna drop a few thoughts here. Definitely everybody should click on YouTube and look for videos from Survival Research Laboratories and their performances, they, they really were the inception of this form of art, which led, led to the groups of the Seamen with Cal Speltech and his work on Helco, and also the People Haters, which then inspired our next group of artists to do their work. And we're gonna check in next with the uh, Flaming Lotus Girls. And I think that they have a, a presentation that they're gonna show us first, and then we'll talk to them about their years on the playa. So. Uh, Flaming Lotus Girls, if you're ready for your presentation, let's go ahead and have that. Hi there. So, Flaming Lotus Girls, we are a volunteer group of artists who make large-scale kinetic fire art. We're going to tell you a little bit about our art and what we do and what makes us special. What we have is, my name is Pune, we have Tamara Lee and Margaret, and we'll all talk because we're a very collaborative group. So we've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, our first piece was called the Flaming Lotus Senior. And what made it really unique was that it was a flame effect, a liquid fuel fire machine, but it was also a sculpture. And 
as you can see, it was painted pink and it had green shellac glitter frame and petals. And so we kind of built on this idea of uh, uh, sculpture and we kind of created these artworks that were really immersive and sculpture installations. But then we started working with bringing people into the art and helping people make the art and be part of the art by pressing buttons, operating uh, controls, and kind of being in the art piece. And they really were designed to come to life with people. And this has become a very kind of magical participatory experience. And so now I'll hand it over to Tamara Lee to talk a little bit about our group, and how we kind of ended up here. Hi, everybody. Oh, start my video. Hello, everybody. I'm talking to you from Maui, Hawaii. Aloha. So uh, here we are in the cell space back shop, um, sitting around on the floor, a very small group of girls cutting flowers out of copper. Um, and, you know, we just started with one person who was Dave X, actually inviting us into the shop and teaching us how to make a flamethrower. None of us had any experience in metalwork. We had no experience in fire art. I mean, at that point, it was the year 2000, and not a lot of folks really did, I would call it, you know, an emerging field <laughs> at the time. And, um, but, you know, it has to start somewhere, and we started by having a vision and wanting to manifest it, and um, that's magical, you know? And, you know, it was fun. It's super fun, super empowering super um that camaraderie that you find that we find see look how much fun we're having over there making things go boom and sparkly um and so you know as we learned and continued to make stuff we had a lot of other women who got really excited and wanted to participate and get involved as well um women at different levels of of skills. We have a NASA engineer or former NASA engineer. We have highly skilled metal workers like Margaret um, and then lots of people who don't know much. And so um, we were really excited as women to invite other women to come into a shop, to become proficient in the shop, to learn safety, to use how to learn how to make tools, learn how to use tools learn how to speak, <laughs> um, how to become proficient, how to design, collaborate, and develop whatever skills we needed to create the vision. Um, and I think it's important to note that once you become a Flaming Lotus girl, doesn't matter what gender you're assigned at birth, everybody's a girl. Um, so the spirit of inclusivity, accessibility, direct participation has always been um, an essential element of the Flaming Lotus girls and something that is carried through from the beginning all the way through now. And, you know, being there in the beginning, it's been really exciting for me to watch that, that whole process happen over the last 20 years. Um, and as you can see, we have dozens and hundreds of girls have come through and had this life-changing, transformative experience of participating in the art making. And over time, that art has gotten really big and it requires a lot of people to make the art. Um, so what I'm saying is when the time comes, if you folks listening today are interested, you are invited. And speaking of the art, we're gonna have Margaret talk more about our art. Hello. So I'm gonna do a relatively quick overview of some of our key sculptures. We have 14 major works of art and going into each one will take way too long. I'm gonna focus on an overall progression of the last 20 years. And if you have questions about specific things, we'll do some Q&A chat at the end. So we didn't start off very big. It was pretty small. Uh, most important to us was including anyone in the build who wanted to be a part of it, having flame effects that could be accessed by anyone. And of course, building something that was beautiful. It was pretty scrappy. Uh, most of those first pieces aren't around anymore. The hand of God was a step up. It was bigger, the craftsmanship was a bit better, um, the flames got a lot bigger, and it was the first time FLG had had a need for a perimeter and more advanced fire controls. And the spectacle was just this huge, great shared experience. 
So Seven Sisters, which is the Pleiades, was a benchmark for the group. It was our first sculpture that made a big space within the sculpture. The flame effects were more kinetic, there were more buttons for people to push, and it created a landscape within itself that included anyone within its perimeter. And as Tamara was saying, inclusivity is FLG's key tenet. We're always recruiting, always trying to include as many people as we can, and buttons were the first step in that direction. Having effects accessible to anyone was novel, but only one person can push a button at a time. So with that ethic of immediate inclusivity, our sculptures progressed to designs that cr could create spaces that involve everyone just by being at the sculpture. The Angel of the Apocalypse was, amongst other things, a realization of that design philosophy, a sculpture that you were really encompassed by, that was designed to be sat on, buttons played with, maybe have an epic hoed on that, and you were just part of that huge fiery experience. You can't really talk about Flaming Lotus Girls without mentioning the Serpent Mother, of course. It's a massively charismatic sculpture. The hydraulically actuated head, the 41 poofers, the liquid shooter. It very quickly became a signature piece for us. The Serpent has been to Playa twice and it's been shown all over the world. And it brings that immediate inclusion wherever we go. And again, this is a sculpture that you get all up in. You're a part of her when you're with her, and everyone that's been with her has a story to tell about it. The group managed to not self-implode after the 2006 Serpent build, and we've continued to build sculptures that aim to create spaces that are inclusive and empowering from the initial build process all the way to the participant interaction. The overall size of our sculpture is maxed out in about 2011, and our goals of reaching more and more people with the art began to expand beyond the playa which has led to some other design considerations. Buttons and space making are still important elements, but we began to focus on the ability to show easily in other venues. We want to make art is, that is beautiful, that incorporates fire in meaningful ways, and that can be shared. The size, ease of setup, flame effects that are fire marshal friendly, and options for longer term installs have become part of our design criteria, all in the aim of including more and more people. And sometimes that does mean trading the fire out for a long-term public installation. For instance, our beautiful neuron Soma has been installed in public since 2014. The flame effects are replaced by LEDs, but we still have buttons for people to push. And just think of how many people have been able to come up to that sculpture and push buttons in the last six years. The more places we can bring our sculptures, the more people we get to include, that's always our biggest goal. Thank you guys. And, and I, you know, I have to move on to the next group, but I think one thing I wanted, we have like two minutes left before I need to go to the next section. But I think the, 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 the common thread I'm seeing here is just like SRL invited people in to start working and learning how to use the machines. And Mark was very good about training people how to use industrial machines that none of us had ever even seen or heard of before and work on them. The Flaming Lotus Girls has continued that that same process. And a lot of these projects at Burning Man, irregardless of, of fire art, it, it means that there's an opportunity for a super cool school, so to speak, a badassery of university teaching is going on on the playa where people are just given a tool and said, here's how to use it, go for it. And then they become masters of that tool. And I think Flaming, Flaming Lotus Girls wise, you have really uh, rocked that and taken the, the training part to a new level. You're cranking out people with competent technical skills like nobody else's business. So I wanna point out that the, the transition here was we went from the survivor research labs to semen and people hater and performance. And now we're getting into the Flaming Lotus Girls years where you added a button. Uh, does anybody remember the story of the first button? I remember distinctly that it was a makeup case if I'm remembering it correctly and it was on a long cord. Does somebody want to tell a quick story about the first interactivity of that button box and any stories involving it? Uh, I, I guess I can just quickly, it wasn't a, um, wasn't a makeup box, but we made sure that we shellacked glitter onto that box as well as made sure that there was space, special compartments for our lipstick. So, 
it, in effect, it was indeed a makeup box. And how did people react to being able to push the button? Because this was different. It wasn't a performance. Those people were the performance. Yeah, I think just the awe and wonder of being able to control it and being like pressing it and seeing that power and experiencing that power and knowing you have that connection is just, it's the best feeling. Super killer adrenaline rush, but I th it just lasts, you know, it just, it's an experience like no other. And it's just super fun and you feel viscerally the power and the heat of the flame. Well, thanks, you guys. And uh, we're going to get more questions at the end here, but I want to make sure we got time for all the artists. So uh, next, we're going to look at a, a third group of folks here. And I'm going to introduce uh, Gray Davis and Misha Neiman from uh, Majorly Arts, if I pronounced it correctly. And pronouncing things correctly is not my specialty, but uh, they represent what I consider the third year now. And in the beginning years, like uh, Christian was saying, there was no regulation. It was just come and do what, whatever looked good and common sense came into play. If it looked like dangerous, it was dangerous and you got away from it. But by the time we're progressing now into this, you know, we self-regulated ourselves, rightly so, so that we could keep up this kind of thing at Burning Man and maintain it into the future. And then these newer folks have, have benefited from that where they started out with folks who already knew the, the guidelines for putting together these things. There was opportunities for education on how to put stuff together properly. And then there was also all this really technical control stuff and, and, and amazing computer interfaces with these flame effects, which were just in the original days, just turned on and off or switched or, or you know, levers moved and pulled. But now we're getting into really a technical style of flame effects. And so, yeah, they got a little video we're going to take a look at first, and then we'll talk to those folks. So let's watch the next video.
after I watched that video, it made me think about uh, a couple things here. And I think that seeing your work, you could see things like the fuel depot is like our standard Burning Man fuel depot that, you know, the, the lines are trenched in a fairly standard way. So in a way, you leapfrogged off of the work of the, the semen and the, and the Helco years and leapfrogged off of the work that the Flaming Lotus girls did. And each time they get more and more complex and more and more intricate. And I also saw that super complex uh, control panel that you had there. I, I, I couldn't even tell you what was going on. You could have had the same thing in a Star Wars movie on the Death Star. So how do you think that your work has been influenced by the work of the folks who went before? And, and where do you think that that's going to go? Are you going to influence more people from your work? So I, I just want to get your thoughts on that leapfrogging effect that we've had throughout the event. Yeah, Greg, do you want to take this one? Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, so our 2015 was our first sculpture. You saw the serpent hanging in the air there. And I never actually got any good footage of the flame effects up on top of it, the dorsal fin. Um, but that year, I remember setting up our fuel depot and thinking, gosh, we have to have some kind of defensible space around this fuel depot. It has to have some kind of rigid barrier because we've been talking to FAST and FAST had given us some of those kind of um, guidelines. And I remember going over to FLG Sculpture that year and taking a look at what they had done and coming on back and then we built something uh, to defend our own fuel depot. Um, and uh, just likewise, I uh, spent a bunch of time all of the first number of years that I attended Burning Man 2009 onward uh, every time I'd find a flame effect, I would stop and, and talk with the folks who were building those flame effects and learned how to build a fire tornado, which I later built, and, uh, and um, just learned how fire poofers work from the Department of Spontaneous Combustion and um, ongoingly uh, just would, would pester people until they told me to go away. Um, but it usually took an hour because everybody likes talking about this stuff once you know how it works. Um, so really, a lot of that education came through uh, some very generous um, conversations with a lot of different fire artists over the years. Yeah, and I think I want to kind of uh, tail on to that and say it's really funny because when we first built the the Dancing Serpent, I think I was like 21 or 22 and Gray, you were like 24 or 25. And I kind of remember just walking into a Home Depot and grabbing random things and making my own propane poofer and being like, oh, this is how this works. Um, so I have that memory as well, but I also uh, remember just like talking to Fast and knowing, coming into, I think, building bigger sculptures with the more guidelines from Fast and for safety issues that I had to be aware of. And I think that's because we were able to kind of leapfrog off of these different schools of people who came before us. And I think for people who come after us, I know that we often talk to a lot of awesome people that we meet in our sculptures, around our sculptures. Um, and I am hoping to see just a lot more movement and a lot more like careful placement of fire in the art. I think that there's so much that can be done if you utilize fire as an actual material uh, within your art piece rather than, and, and I love the poofers. I think they're so dramatic and I love that you can do them on playa. I just, I just also want to see fire being this like elemental material uh, that's utilized in a lot of different art pieces going forward. Yeah, the, you know, you mentioned the FAST team and I think that's one thing that I'm really proud of with my FAST team. You see our FAST <laughs> logo here. But the, the fire art safety team is composed from people who work in the special effects industry, people in the fuel industries and primarily artists who've been with us for a long time and have a success rate and our not our job is not like the standard municipal fire marshal who is there to tell you 10 reasons why it's not allowed we're there to tell you why your idea isn't so great and ways that you could make it better to try to reapply to us to get it over the threshold and if we can't help you because we have that catalog of knowledge of artists in the background we can recommend another art group and say, you know, look, you should go talk to the FLG. They're working on that kind of project. They got those parts over in their thing. You don't have to drive all the way to Reno. Why don't you go over here? We're, we're, we're offering to tell you ways to go forward. I mean, there's some things where we're gonna say, hell no, that's, that's not allowed under any circumstances. But if there's any like slight possibility that it can move forward, we're gonna say the reasons why it doesn't move forward and give you ways to move it forward 
And that's an important difference, I think, between the fire art safety team and your standard municipal fire authorities. Now, I can't speak to everyone. Obviously, there's probably a lot of really good teaching folks on that, but we're primarily there to teach before we're there to regulate. We actually I have think a that's... mole in our crew. We actually have a mole in our crew who's, uh, he's part of our crew and also part of the FAST team. So we get a lot of of knowledge from him too. Yeah. yeah I feel like it's important to, to shout out to him because his name is Bruce Sherrod and he's, he's done a lot of the spearheading of the flame effects work on these cultures over the last five years. So sure. working closely with him has been an amazing boon. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we got a great bunch of folks there at Burning Man and we're really keeping this tradition alive. Uh, so one more question I wanted to ask you. I was looking at that control board uh, again when we saw <laughs> in the video and it made me think about the future of flame effects. Do you guys have any predictions about where, where this art is going to go? I mean, I think that the folks who originally made the first accumulator never even dreamt of that kind of complexity. And how do you think that electronics and computer controls are going to be a future in this uh, art? So a couple of things on that one. And then Gray, feel free to jump on after me. Um, the control board is part of a, a piece called Towers of Crete that was led by our good friend Dan Fennelly. Uh, we shared the same crew and so we worked on it as though it was ours. Um, and Dan and Jeremy Silver and Bruce uh, created this amazing app. That, uh, I know it's so, it's so San Francisco in 2020, but they created this app that allows um, pretty much any one of the crew to control the flame effect from 200 feet away. Um, and you could just, you download it on your phone. We had a Wi-Fi set up for the LEDs and you'd be anywhere around the sculpture. And if anything uh, dangerous was to happen, if any kind of spill was to occur, anyone on the crew can turn it off. And on the opposite side, if you ever wanted to like flirt with a cute person, you just turn it on and you could uh, trigger the poofer in the bull skull itself. So you got to be the cool person who controlled the entire sculpture. And so that kind of, you know, marriage of, of uh, technology and flame effects just kind of makes uh, me shiver. But um, yeah, Greg, do you have any future premonitions? Yeah, I mean, I think you said that pretty pretty brilliantly. Um, I was very proud of this kind of three-tiered safety system that was on there. Fast, fast uh, standard shutoff valves was kind of our second uh, step. The first step was just a single button. You punch it and everything goes down. And then the, the, the fallback was this app. You could walk far away and just bring the flame effects down with the app. So I thought that was pretty cool. But also, um, uh, to your point, Dave, about the technological directions that this might go, I was quite proud of that sculpture also um, that, uh, that Daniel led and that, that we all worked on, that um, the flame effects were integrated into a game that the sculpture built. So people would run around ringing bells on the different sculptures. And if they did it all correctly, then they would be rewarded with the flaming poop. So we really built the flames into the, uh, the way that the game functioned and to the essence of the sculpture and uh, used those flames as a reward for people if they were interacting with it correctly. And that's only possible because of a fair amount of software and, and uh, electronic hardware that was built into the sculpture on the back end. So I think that um, the sky is kind of the limit if uh, we start marrying more and more of these technologies together uh, with the power and the beauty of fire and also the kind of nuanced control of some of these other um, technologies. Yeah, I, I think yeah. you're right. And I think the first time I really saw that kind of real inter electronic space interactivity was the project Dance Dance, uh, or no, Dance Ardent. Revolution, was Dance, it? Dance Simulation. Dance, 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 Dance Simulation, live, that's I right. I live with, with two of the creators of Dance Dance Simulation right now. One yeah, and I remember when they first proposed that, they said, look, Dave X, we've got this game <laughs> thing, and you're going to dance on a dance pan and, and a dance floor, and if you miss any of your dance steps, you're going to be completely covered in fire. I thought, well, okay, I don't, I don't really understand how you won't die in that. And then he said, well, here, here's the story. And again, this is how the fast will help work with you. He said, I've got this suit, the silver suit, and it's meant for oil fire, oil rig firefighting. And it's called an entry suit. It's meant to go into fire and put out a fire. Its literal job is to enter a fire. 
And and I said, well, well then that's good because the fire will go on you. You'll be in this suit, but you need to provide me the ratings of that. <laughs> suit. Show me the tags and show me that that's not expired. And then I'm going to take you out far away from everybody. And we're going to try this and all you and your friends are going to get in that suit first. And if you guys survive, then we'll take it from there. But they were able to show me that they had a system. They had a system for putting in air, which was had redundancies. They had the, the suit, which is going to protect the people. And they explained step by step how the pieces and parts of their project were rated and designed for what they were going to be used for, which then added up to jackassery and something that was never something that the people who designed any of that equipment ever intended. I don't think the guy who desired the, designed the fire entry suit ever thought that somebody would play a funny video game with it where you'd end up car covered with fire for laughs. But we, we all know amazing. that that project turned out really good and it has an incredible record of safety. I've never heard of a single incident with that. So if you can explain how you're going to do the thing that looks like it's going to kill you and you can do it safely, well, then God bless you. We got a place for you at Burning Man. But you got to show us that there's ratings and stuff that we can fall back on when people say, what were you doing? We got to go back to that and, and say, well, here's the ratings that, that we were able to follow. So I really appreciate the work that you guys have done. And, and I'd really look forward to seeing where this art's going to go. I believe that Katie Hazard has captured a couple questions in the Q&A and we're going to check in with her questions. And then if there's a couple more questions, I'm going to throw it into left field with some of my own questions because that's the way my brain works. So Katie Hazard, let's have the questions from the Q&A. Oh, Dave, I think you live in, in the left field. That's great. <laughs> um, so yeah, if all the artists want to turn their cameras on and I'll direct questions specifically to each of you so you know who it's for. Um, so yeah, thanks people for putting questions in the Q&A box. Here's one for you, Christian, from Kate Roddenbush. She says, from your montage video, it looks like in the later years, your style evolved to more sculpture. What's the story behind that? <laughs> Hi, Kate. Good question. Um, you know, uh, it's kind of a, it's a story of evolution um, from like, <clears throat> you know, in the beginning, I used, I was using a lot more fire, I think in the beginning, but fire for me was always like one tool in the toolbox. And the other one that for me has always, I've always had a passion for is um, mechanical design and like making things move, making things kinetic. Um, and so my big like turning point, I guess, in a way was uh, Hand to Man, which was in 2008. And I had this idea that I wanted to, um, I had been building these robots that were destroying stuff and I realized that it's really fun to watch things get destroyed, but it's more fun to do the destruction yourself. And so I wanted to share that with everybody um, and really democratize, democratize the crushing power. It's one of my little taglines for the hand. And, um, and, uh, so, and share that experience and let everyone put their hand into this thing and, and crush stuff. And, um, and, but that, and, then, and then I had to like figure out like, wh why is this interesting? Why is this cool? And so I had to start thinking about what was underneath it, why the, why the sculpture was popular. And um, it started me thinking about things like empowerment and um, interactivity and stuff like that. And I, I, it kind of started a progression, which really, long story short, pushed me a lot more in the direction of being interested in the ideas that underlie the art and offering people um, an experience that's not only like visual, and tactile, but also intellectual. Like, um, what is this art about? I want to make people think like, what is this art about? Like, um, you know, Face Forward, which was one like kind of in the middle, um, was about like getting people to think about nonverbal communication and the way we interact with each other with our face. And I could go on about that, but it's very interesting. Um, and so uh, I really just got interested in, in trying to tell a story essentially with the pieces. Um, and so things like mechanical design and fire are tools in the toolbox, but they need, to, in my opinion, they, they, are, they need to be made subservient to the bigger narrative of the piece and often um, just kind of like sculptural virtuosity is the way to go with that, to tell the story. Mm. 
Yeah, you know, I really appreciated your piece in 2018 called With Open Arms, We Welcomed That Which Would Destroy Us. That was the year of iRobot. And yeah. you had such a thoughtful take on humans interaction with technology and what's that, what that's like for us. And I was like, wow, I thought Christian was this like fire artist, knock them, like bang things around. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's got this whole other side that I, you know, came to learn later on about you that I was just like, wow, he's got a lot of range and really interesting, interesting guy. So um yeah, Thanks. we're lucky that you've been sharing your art at Burning Man for so long. That, 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 the theme that year was so great, and I really enjoyed the process of developing that project because it really took me in a different direction. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, FLG, I have a couple questions. One is pretty short. Um, somebody asked, how many people have you taught to create flame effects over all the years? I know you said you started, what, in 2000? So, so well, let's count. Yeah. Let's say 50 people a year for each project. So 14 times 50. My math skills are pretty crappy, so I'm not going to try to do that online. Uh, many, many. <laughs> and, and, lots that, uh, and lots that have gone on to make other art with more people. So it's, it's more art is always good, just more. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and somebody else has another question for you guys, FLG. Could you talk about um, one of the craziest on playa requests for help from another artist? You know, it's usually, I don't think it, they're ever really that crazy. It's always just like, they need this little fitting that does this really specific thing and they don't have it. And like, it's gonna make their entire thing go and they don't have it. It's like a regulator or they need a trenching shovel or they need a little bit of stainless steel wool or they just need this like, flare to NPT fitting that also does size change. So it's like, because we have so much, we always bring extra for people to, to come and get stuff from them because we know they're gonna come over anyway, so we might as well. Uh, but it's, it's great to help people out like that because you know that like they're breaking themselves for their project and they just need this one little thing, just one little thing. And so it's, it's great to be able to do that for people. Yeah. I think the worst one was probably somebody needed an extra like, 150 feet of propane fuel line from their fuel depot to their sculpture. And wow, that's not just like a little it. thing. That's a lot. <laughs> wow. Yeah. We had it though. So all good. Impressive. You had it to spare. Yeah. For folks that aren't um, familiar with Black Rock City, you know, sometimes we get new people to Burning Man joining and Art Speaks. How far away is the closest hardware store? <laughs> so far. <laughs> so far. <laughs> <laughs> too far like impossibly far like you like you got to bring everything you need yeah cool thank you um for misha and gray majorelle and question for you um i well this isn't my question but i was really happy to see you fire spinning in the video that was really cool and the question came um how does fire performance fit into your artwork do you intentionally build artworks that invite fire dancing i think that um, well, yeah, I think that we definitely create spaces uh, that invite people to sit and interact and play. Uh, we put in benches, we put in things to make people comfortable, and we value interact, like participation and interaction and climbing and all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, and also I think naturally, Gray and I love to fire spin. We've been doing it something like 10, 12 years now. And I think naturally our inclination is to make things that we want to interact with. And so what that means is there's almost always a well-lit, nice uh, dance spot for people to congregate and interact, yeah. Yeah, that's definitely true. And um, uh, I'll add, we've, we've just been getting more uh, kind of accumulating fire art forms for years now. So we definitely started with fire dancing before we started building fire sculptures, um, kind of graduated to working with propane. And then in more latter years, we've also started working with uh, pyrotechnics crews and doing some fireworks both on playa and off. And so um, just kind of like joining in at the, the bottom of each of those art forms and getting a lot of help getting trained as we go um, on each of them. So I think we we gravitate towards this, and Dave, you have very eloquent or eloquent words about uh, the power of fire. But it's just such an elemental force, and and so beautiful. And I think that we really prefer that look for our artwork to the the kind of LEDs that are also very beautiful. But um, 
but uh, are a very different look for Burning Man artwork. And so to be out there and to hold fire in our hands and have fire on our sculptures between the playa and the sky is really a special experience. <laughs> That's beautiful, thank you, yeah. And uh, not to give too much away, but you know, this episode is about flame effects and we're hoping over the course of Art Speaks, you know, in the coming year or so that we may do a series of these. So something about pyro and something about open fire, like we can't possibly cover the whole evolution of flame effects in an hour, you know? And so we, we have three artists here with us live or three groups. I see lots of other flame effect artists um, in the chat, but so, so, so many. So um, this is just a, a, the beginning of a look at who has made a difference over the years. Um, Okay, so one more question, um, and this is for all of you. So let's go in order from Christian to FLG to Majorelle. Um, this question's from John Valentino. I've heard several people today talk about using fire in meaningful ways. How is fire meaningful for you and for your art? Um, well, fire has the ability to awe people. Fire has the ability to, um, it, it, uh, the word elemental has been used a lot and it is, fire is elemental. It inspires fear. If you're cold, you wanna get near it. Uh, and uh, if you're at a safe distance, it, it can, it'll blow your mind. It's, it's amazing. And so to me, um, it's kind of like icing on the cake, right? It's like you um, build something, whatever you've built that is, probably amazing and beautiful. And then when you fire off that poofer, poofer or that flamethrower, um, it's kind of the final deal that gives people, it, it's very experiential. It gives people an experience. So like I said, in the, la the last time I was babbling on, it's a tool, right? It's one of the tools, um, but it's a very powerful tool because of these elemental um, reactions that it that it evokes in people. It's instinctual. We are afraid of fire and we love it. And it's, um, it, it, it's very powerful. So to me, it, it's kind of like that, that last little push in a sculpture that is already amazing. And then you blow the fire and people are like, oh my God, I had no idea it was going to do that. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone from FLG want to say something about that? I'll go yeah. a little bit just for a um, Christian was just talking about how it's a tool and it's like the icing on the cake. And I think that's absolutely true in a lot of respects. Um, I do think that for some of the pieces with FLG, it was about the fire. It was about the pieces not complete without the fire. And the experience of that artwork was the in, the fire was um, integral to that experience, and so I think that, um, yeah, I just I just wanted to kind of say that about some of the work that that Flaming Lotus Girls have done. Um, but having said that, you know, the sculptural aspects are are absolutely super important, and the participatory experience and that vis that visceral pow that you get is is like I said before, nothing like it. That's true. Like you push that button and it's like, whoof, you know, and the heat and the, like it really, yeah, there, it's, there's yeah. nothing like it. And it really only happens at Burning Man, at least from what I've seen in my life. <laughs> um, Misha or Gray, would you, either of you like to? Yeah, respond to I that? think for me, fire is extremely beautiful. Um, it's warming and it's, it's badass. It's all these things, but it's fundamentally, it's beautiful. And I like the way that our sculptures look when it's lit up with the fire. I know that we all have to, you know, turn it on and turn it off. And when it's off, we have to have LEDs. And, but I think at the very cusp, like core of it, um, I've designed and I, I, Gray and I have designed all of our pieces to be at its like prettiest when the fire is on, when you could see it in that glow. Um, and we, it, it shows in the way that people participate and interact with those sculptures when they're actually on and manned at the crew with the propane flame effects going on. It's just, people are just attracted to it. And I love that. Um, good. 
Yeah, I'll just add that fire is, fire is just so powerfully symbolic. And if you ask a dozen different people, you'll probably get a dozen different things that it means to them, but no one will tell you that it's not powerful. And so each of our sculptures has incorporated it in a different way. And, uh, you know, in Scriptorium, for instance, it's the, the um, creature is holding a lantern aloft, and the piece is all about the history of writing. Um, in, uh, in Methuselah, we put the fire at the heart of the tree and with the model of this 5,000-year-old tree um, as a symbol of ancestry and evolution. And uh, so, you know, it, it is a wonderfully mutable symbolic substance um, that also brings such tremendous beauty to the pieces. And so we keep coming back to it year after year for that. Yeah, I've really appreciated how your work finds a certain gracefulness in fire. Like there's a there's an elegance to yours that um, that I've really appreciated over the and years. Katie, do you yeah. mind if I uh, give you a couple closing thoughts here before we get to the sure. last part here? Mm -hmm. So I, I think you guys are touching on what you like about fire. And I think for me, when, when we were realizing that the event was canceled, I thought one of the most important things was to try to bring some form of fire to it. And I immediately started working on a build and burn your own Burning Man at Home project. And you can find out more information on that on Kindling. But I think that if you look back to all the rituals of the event, you go all the way back, all the way back. You've got Larry and Jerry bringing their first man to the beach and they didn't have any intention of creating a counterculture phenomenon or anything. They just thought, let's burn something on the beach. Some friends will bring some food and some wine. And as soon as they lit it on fire, other people came in from the darkness to be by the fire. And that's one of the instincts that man has is when you see food and, and you see a fire and people standing by it, you want to go stand in that circle. And then those people came up and said, hey, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're burning this man. It's a burning man. And then, you know, they said, that's cool. You know, and then they showed up the next year to do it again. And more people came and saw it. And if you look throughout history, campfires and the the warmth and gathering around the fire has created a lot of community when you're standing by the fire you share things you talk about things you say what happened in your day you have, it's a point of conversation so the fire hit, on another scale besides the awesome awe of huge projects like helco is also that campfire thing where you're drawn to it and you make connections it's a community builder it could be a community destroyer when it gets out of control too, but it can also be a community builder. And I think that's one of the great aspects of Burning Man. That's our first ritual was having fire and gathering to meet people and having some snacks and sharing stories. And that, that's what I see as a thread running through all of these projects. Even the Helco year where it was, you didn't know whether you should flee in fear or stare and wonder or, or try to figure out what, what the hell was going on at Helco but you still wanted to be near it. It's, and you still talk to people next to you going, oh, should we run this time to go? You know, it, but it still created community. So those are my final thoughts on the fire creating community, Katie. Thanks, Dave. I mean, nobody knows it better than you really. So <laughs> it's really um, been a, a treat to have you here hosting this with us today. And, um, and really thank you so much to all the artists that joined us. Uh, it's, uh, not just for being here with us with this hour today, but, you know, looking back at all the, the work that you've shown us, all you've put in over the years, I mean, things that have like blown people's minds and it's created new generations of fire artists, like really like deep thanks for, for all you've put in over the years. Um, and I want to thank everyone that's joining us here tonight. Um, thanks so much for supporting the artists and for whatever ways you are finding this week to, to keep the magic of Burning Man alive for you personally and in your community. If you have any feedback about Art Speaks, you can reach us at artspeaks at burningman.org. And there can be more art in your future. Um, the next Art Speaks is on Wednesday, September 23rd. This time it'll be at noon Pacific. And the theme for this one is going to be, where is it now? So we're going to hear some stories from artists whose work went from Black Rock City, went on to find some kind of interesting life post Playa. So registration will be on Kindling, and there's a link there in the chat. And as Dave said, if you're wondering what to do this Saturday night, um, it's the man burn night. And so you too can build and burn your own man um, live from home. We'll put the link for that in the chat. It's a 24 hour thing starting on Saturday. So it's kind of like those New Year's that travel around the world sort of thing. So starting at 9 p.m. in New Zealand, it'll continue all the way around. So if you're in Pacific time, it starts at 2 a.m. like super early Saturday morning and goes all the way till 2 a.m. Um, late Saturday night. And so at 9 p.m. your local time, somebody will be burning something there. So you can create a camp or a kind of watch party to watch it with your friends. 
So um, yeah, no matter where you are at 9 p.m., you'll have a burn to go to. And, and also it's kind of cool, like this year, we all get to be the man crew, you know, it's, it's like an honor and um, to build the man in Black Rock City. And this year we all get to be artists and build our own man. Uh, also the temple is still open for offerings. Um, it's burn week, right? So the temple is open right now. If you'd like to make an offering, you can do so. If you'd like to have a temple experience, you're welcome to take a visit. And then Sunday night at 8 p.m., the temple will burn as it always does. And Virtually. then- Yes, virtually. <laughs> um, although they're, they're actually, the, the offerings um, are all getting created virtually as well, and they're saved on a hard drive that will physically be burned and melted. So, um, so your offerings truly will be destroyed and, and sent up. Um, and then lastly, I know you are all doers. You all are really active in your community in whatever way, but I invite you to continue to give in the ways that you do and let you know that the work that our team does year round to support these artists is part of the larger mission of Burning Man Profit Project, which is a nonprofit. So if you feel moved to support us, we would really appreciate your help. We've had 90% of our revenue cut this year for having to cancel the in-person Black Rock City. So um, we really need as much help as we can to keep continuing. And um, you know, we really wanna continue the series and bring back the, the flaming magic of Black Rock City in all of its glory. So please um, visit donate.burningman.org. And just want to say a huge thanks to all of you again for joining. Have a great evening. Go check out the multiverse. And thanks again to all the artists for coming. And that's all. Have a great thanks, evening, Dave. everyone. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you. Go burn something safely. <laughs> uh, cool. Thanks, y'all.